Oh, well, this morning, Springs Church, I'm excited to announce we actually have a guest speaker with us. Uh, Sam Williamson is actually here with us. He did the Hearing God Conference over the last two days. If you've been here Friday and Saturday, it was amazing. If you had a chance to be there, um, I took notes all through the two, four sessions that we were there. What, I forget how many we were actually there for, but I took notes. I was jotting things down. And what I loved about the Hearing God Conference, this is actually his book that you could pick up. He goes through what he shared in the conference through his book. It'll be in the info table after, is that it's not only theological, but it's very practical. You really can apply it to your life. And for those that are having a tough time hearing God, this, this, what he teaches and what he shares is key. So I'd encourage you to pick up the book. I, I was really blessed by it. And not only was I blessed just by the conference, just by spending time with Sam himself and, and just talking together, you could see he is a man who practices, listen to this, he practices real intimacy with God. He spends time with the Lord. He listens to God. And because of that, you could be completely assured that this morning he's going to have a word for us. I've been praying all morning, God, I need a word. I need you to speak to me. I, got, I need things, and I need answers and leading and direction. So this morning, I'm going to call Pastor Sam. Pastor Sam, are you here? Where are you at? I'm going to call him up. He's going to come up to the stage now. Here he comes. Let's give him a round of applause. He has been ministering to us all weekend long. Let's thank him for that. Love Amen. I'm going to let him just lead us into the word now. Let's just take a minute and pray. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, I pray that you open our eyes to see you. What we need more than anything in this world is to see you in your glory, to see you lifted high and yet coming down to, to love us. So I pray, Father, through your Holy Spirit, open our ears and open our eyes. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. My first job after college was as a missionary in Europe. And Europe at the time had very, very low church attendance. Many of the students that I dealt with at the university age had never been to church, or they might have been uh, baptized in a church at a very early age, but they'd never been back since. And so it was really a great time for me to be a missionary. And when I, I was living in London, although I worked in London, Belgium, and Paris, and we met with other university leaders because we just wanted to hear what was going on with them. And one time, the, the men that I was living with and I met with a man who was doing university ministry in London. And we, us men who were doing this ministry, were baptized in the Holy Spirit. We were charismatic. We loved the way the Spirit worked in our lives. And we asked this man that we were meeting with what his prayer life was like. And he said, in my prayer life, what I do is... I think about God. I meditate about his words. I fill my mind with his truth. Now, honestly, we said we sort of prefer exuberant worship, singing, raising our hands, clapping, dancing, hours in the prayer room, guitar. And when we got home that night, we sat around the dinner table. We sort of snickered at this shallow, ivory-towered, spiritual egghead. <laughs> that man was John Stott. In 2004, Time Magazine said John Stott was one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And as a 22-year-old, I snickered at him at his shallowness. John Stark began each day by praying the Psalms, by meditating on the Psalms, by thinking about the Psalms, but prayerful thinking before God in his presence. Because praying the Psalms is a type of meditation. Psalm 49.3 says, my mouth will speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart should be understanding. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. What the psalm itself is saying is we have problems in our lives. And the, one of the ways we solve our, the mystery of our problems is through the psalms. 
It was a man named Athanasius the Great. He, he, he was a great man in the 300s, 1700 years ago, because he was fighting the cultural, worldly influence that was corrupting the church. He was called Athanasius against the world because he was always fighting the world. And you know what he said gave him power to fight the world? He said, whatever your particular need or trouble, from the Psalms you can select a form of words to fit it so that you learn your way to remedy your ill. For thousands of years, believers, really since the time of David, have prayed the Psalms. It's been their psalm, it's, it's been their prayer book. It's what's taught us to pray. In Jesus' day, all the Jewish believers prayed the Psalms at morning, noon, dinner time, and before they went to bed. They went through the entire book of Psalms, probably, I mean, we're not sure exactly, but probably 15 or 20 times a year. If you think Jesus was just average, he did it 15 or 20 times a year. There's a good chance Jesus went through the Psalter more than 15 or 20 times a year. Because the Psalms were the media of that day and age. Now, now we are inundated with the media. I want you to, I want you to finish the sentence. Twas the night before Christmas. I want you to finish this Beatles song. I want to hold your twist and you know, an old Wendy's commercial. Where's the You see, these are things that we've known our whole life, right? I mean, we don't have to even think about it. This was the heart and soul of believers, not to mention Jesus, but believers for hundreds of years to know the Psalter that way. You could say the first three words of a Psalter and people would finish it. This was their media. Believers were, were inundated, were overflowing with the word of God. Jesus didn't have the media we have. He has the Spirit. He had the Holy Spirit. And when we pray the Psalms, now listen to this. When we pray the Psalms, we're praying with Jesus. We're praying the very words that Jesus prayed as he was growing up. I mean, when we want to learn to pray, Jesus prayed every word we pray when we pray the Psalms. He quoted from Psalms more than any other book in Scripture. Today I want us to look at Psalm 1. It's a short psalm. I'm going to read it to us. Blessed is the man who walks not... Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither, and in all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. There are sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now, there are classic categories of psalms, and if you read books on psalms, you'll see different classic. But the classic categories are, are psalms of praise, psalms of thanksgiving, psalms of confession, psalms of thanksgiving, and psalms of request or psalms of supplication, you know, asking God of stuff. And the very first psalm in the book of Psalms fits none of those categories. I mean, I mean it's all, if, you, if you think about Psalm 1, it's almost like it would have fit better as an introduction to Proverbs than to Psalms. It's, it's like the editor of the book of Psalms put it all together and someone says, oh, Psalm 1 should have been in Proverbs. And he says, you're right. Too late. It's gone to press. Think God made a mistake? It's a weird way to introduce the Psalms, but you know what? I really believe it's intentional. I, of course, I believe it's intentional, God. <laughs> All that you do has a purpose. 
but it teaches us something about the nature of Psalms. And that is, Psalms are not only prayers, but Psalms are meditations themselves. Psalms are ways of looking at the world. Psalms are ways of looking at our own lives. Psalms are ways of looking at God. Psalms are the way we understand reality, true reality, including the Spirit. All Psalms are meditations. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I will not want. It's a meditation on the grandeur of the shepherd in, the, in Jesus, in the Lord. It's the grandeur of this, this mighty God who created heaven and earth, who treats us as though he's our personal shepherd. And when we meditate on that, we grow in confidence in life, in who he is, and how we can face the difficulties. Psalm 30 says, I will extol you. I cried to you and you helped me. Psalm 30 is a meditation that is a memory meditation. It says, I've seen how you worked over the years. You parted the Red Sea and you protected us. You protected our lives. Our sandals did not wear out. 40 years in the wilderness, how did that happen? It's a meditation remembering if that's the God who did it and God's the same yesterday and today and tomorrow, that same God is here for me today. It's a meditation saying, I want to see what God has done in the past so that I have confidence and assurance in the presence. That's what Psalm 30 is. Psalm 73 is, you know, is, is really somebody admitting that they, Psalm 73 says, I believe God was good, but then when I looked at all the wicked prospering, I said, holy smokes, I sort of want to be like that, God. And he's, he's admitting this. He's saying, I started to say, what good is it being a believer? What, what value is there? What hope is there? And you know, his answer is, he says, I did all this until I went into the temple. And when I saw you, it's all worthwhile. Psalm 73 is a meditation. Well, Psalm 1 is a meditation. That's what we're going to look at. Someone teaches us to meditate. So I'm going to read verse 1 again. Blessed is the man. And the, and the Hebrew here is, is the person. Blessed is the man and woman and child and old man and old woman and young child. Blessed are they who walk not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Now, I first want to talk about the word blessedness. The word blessedness in Hebrew here it means total fulfillment. It's total satisfaction. This, this, is, this is Psalm 23. Remember, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, it's not that I don't have desires. It's that God fulfills all my desires. I'm hungry, well, he leads me in, he leads me beside, uh, in green pastures. I'm thirsty, he leads me beside still waters. And when, and, and when the passage says this person is blessed, it means it's a total satisfaction of all our needs, of all our desires, of our longings. It's stability. It's joy. It's fruitfulness. But he contrasts this with the wicked. Now, I know there may be people here today who really are offended at the word wicked. And we, we, I've, I know people who have left the church because they've heard the word wicked and they're offended. And I just want to encourage you to hear this out, okay? So here is, I understand that this is, a, this is an offensive word. God doesn't pretend not to be offensive. But God, God gives us a progression. Well, it's actually sort of a regression. God teaches us the path of wickedness. What he says is, we start by walking in the counsel of the wicked. And then we move into standing in the way of sinners. And the final step is we sit in the seat of scoffers. And this is what happens to us. I was watching a TV show recently. You know, a, a boyfriend was pressuring, encouraging, whatever, the girlfriend to sleep with him. And she wanted to. And she goes to her pastor. And she says, you know, pastor, I don't want to sleep with him, but I sort of want to. What should I do? And the pastor says, well, what does your heart say? Well, she says, my heart says to sleep with him, you know? I mean, the counsel of the wicked is, so she sleeps with him. You know what happens? For the next year, she's just sleeping with him. She walks from the counsel of the wicked to standing in the way of sinners. It's, it's no longer even a question. Her conscience isn't even seared at this point. She doesn't even think about it. But by the end of the show, she's sitting in the seat of scoffers and just laughing at those prudes. Do you see this downward progression that happens to us? 
But scripture says the blessedness comes to those whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on their law he meditates day and night. Now, I just want to mention one thing here, that the word law that's used in Psalm 1 doesn't just refer to the Ten Commandments. In fact, Jesus, in John 10, 34, he says, is it not written in your law that I say you are all gods? But he doesn't quote the Ten Commandments. He quotes Psalm 82. So in the Hebrew culture, when they said the law, they meant the whole counsel of Scripture. And, and the psalmist here says, blessed, total fulfillment, satisfaction, joy, comes to those who, met, who delight in God's word and meditate on it day and night. And it's not just a delight. The passage says, blessed are those whose delight. This is, this is the joy of their heart, joy of their life. The psalmist says, that person shall be blessed. And, and this is why they, and, and they meditate day and night. In Hebrew, day and night doesn't just mean, okay, I do it for breakfast and I do it for dinner. It, it was a metaphor that said, I do it all the time. I do it in the good seasons. I do it in the spring and I do it in the fall. I do it in the summer and I do it in the winter. I meditate on God's word when things are going my way and I meditate on God's word when things aren't, in season and out of season. Let's go on and talk a little bit more about the blessedness because the psalmist wants to expand on what the blessedness is. The psalmist says, this person is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Now, the psalmist intentionally is asking us to meditate and think and asking us to say, what is the contrast between these two ways of life? The blessedness is solidity. It's, I mean, a tree, think of an oak tree, it's solid. Try to tackle an oak tree. It's, there's something substantive, real, tangible, as opposed to the chaff. The chaff was the husk of a seed. You know, it looks like a seed, but it's empty. It's insubstantial. The wind, the slightest wind can send it flying. A tree endures. The husk just gets blown away. The tree bears fruit. Now think of this. Imagine this image from God. God says, you are a tree that bears fruit. And what he means by this, what God is saying is, look, at your roots are in this stream the stream of the Holy Spirit, the stream of the truth of God, the stream of the life of Jesus' self inside us. But he says, you're not like a hose pipe. You're not a garden hose. A garden hose has, you know, the water comes in one side and water goes out the other side. God says, I have so decided to make you my partners that I have given you some kind of spiritual transformation ability to take the water in and produce pears and pomegranates and peaches. And he says, and I'm giving you this ability. I mean, the husk just pretends it's a seed and it's nothing. And God says, you're a tree that brings in water and produces apples. I mean, what a, what? don't we want a life of purpose? Holy smokes, this is like the most incredible promise of God. He says, look, I could just bring in water inside and, and, and water the world and you'd love it. I mean, you would feel I'm part of God's plan. But God says, no, I want to do even more in you. I have given you some kind of spiritual ability to take water and create fruit. What a promise of God. And he contrasts with the, with, you know, again, the emptiness, the chaffiness of life. Years ago, when I was in college, I read a book called The Unbearable Lightness of Being. It's by a man named Milan Kandara, and he was an existentialist. It's sort of the rootless existentialist, and the truth is you don't have to read the book the unbearable lightness of being, it's like, I don't even exist. There's an insignificance. There's a tumbleweed quality about me. That's not what God is offering us. He's offering a solidity, a durability, a stability. The 
The psalm closes by saying, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the pick, where wicked will perish. When God says, I, will, I know the way of the righteous, it's the same word that God says when he says, Adam knew Eve. It's incredible intimacy. When God says he knows the way of the righteous, he is promising an intimacy and a connection with us that goes beyond mere acquaintance. You know, I shake your hand, it's good to see you. God is saying, I have come to put my very life inside you, to live in you, to make my home in you. I know it because we are intimate that intimate. It's an, it's an unbelievable promise of God. And he says, the way of the wicked will perish, meaning... Look at, I know that you think the world's answers make sense because the world presents it that way. But they will not last. On the outside, they look good. They look like a seed. But on the inside, it's hollow and it's empty. There's not a leg to stand on. The way of the wicked will perish. So that's the psalm. But let's just meditate on it a little bit. The first temptation in Genesis 3 began with a scoff, with a sneer. Satan says, did God really say you can't eat of that tree? Now, do you hear this? This is, this is the classic thing. Satan doesn't start out by saying, oh, God's lying to you. That's what he says next. But he starts out with a sneer. And that, I, my experience is when I talk to people who have left Christianity, they almost all have left Christianity because of the sneer more than the lie. You know, when I was in college, I had professors who would say, can you really turn on a light switch in this day and age and also believe in a God who was raised from the dead? I mean, really? Well, that's not an argument. I mean, is it that hard to believe in a God who lets us invent light switches? I mean, to me, that sounds like a good God. I mean, but people were taken out by the sneer. The sneer undermines us. The sneer takes us away. Last September, last October, I was coming, I did a Hearing God retreat in Seattle, and I was coming back, and I sat on the plane next to a young man. And, you know, you, you talk to the guy next to you. I actually don't very much, but I did this time. And the man was maybe 30-ish, and he had been to Seattle because he was um, applying for a job at a computer gaming company. And, and he said to me, yeah, but they didn't, they didn't get me. They were just a bunch of suits. And I thought, I mean, did they really wear suits in Seattle? I mean, I, I just thought they didn't, you know. He said, no, 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 they didn't wear suits. It's just like they're hot air balloons, you know, just full of nothing, full of themselves. I said, okay. He said, but, and they didn't get me. They didn't understand my contribution. I said, okay. And then, you know, the flight attendant brings his coffee, and he looks at the coffee, and he says, this is just Starbucks. It's not quality gourmet coffee. And he turned it back. And then he looked at me, and he says, you have a Windows PC, not a Mac. I can't believe it. And then he said, you know, I have a story to write. That's really my goal. I was in college and my professors didn't get me, so I had to drop out of college. And he's working at Lowe's, 30 years old. And you know, my, you know, I mean, on one hand, we can see it. My heart went out to him because here was a guy who's dismissing all things in the world. Why? Because of a sneer. This is really sometimes the biggest temptation we have is we have just a sneer. It's our cynicism. We're just cynical. That's what happens when we adopt the world's ways. We slowly become cynical. And you know what happened to me when I was talking to this young man? I started to feel cynical about millennials. And I felt like God say, Sam, my gosh, what is your problem? I mean, we all do it. I dare you 60-year-olds who are with me not to have thought the same thing. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to raise hands. But cynicism steals joy from our heart. And this is the end of the downward spiral of wickedness. We walk in the council, we stand in the way, and we sit in the seat of scoffers. And it totally sucks our soul of life, of hope, of joy. 
So when Satan tempts Eve, Adam and Eve, what does Eve do? She meditates. Now, I didn't put the scripture passage up there, but this is in um, Genesis 3. Scripture says, Eve saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise. What is she doing? This is what we do. Meditation is not putting on yoga pants and sitting in some kind of awkward position. Meditation is the way we think about life. My wife and I recently bought a house that we can use for retreats, but for years before that, we meditated on it, meaning we weren't consciously meditating it. We were just thinking, what would our life be like if we had this house and we could have people over to do retreats? We think about it. When my wife, when my wife and I were pregnant, obviously she was the one pregnant. I just looked like it. And she, she, we, we were having our first baby, and we get the baby room all together, right? We painted it. We put up the little wall boarding. And, and we started to almost experience having a baby before we had it because we were meditating. Meditation changes our life today. It's, it's so important why we have to be careful what we fill our minds with because it, it makes us meditate on all kinds of stuff. And, I, and I'm not talking about Einstein. I'm not asking any of us to be an Einstein. Scripture says that we are all meditating all the time. I, I'm angry at my coworker, and I say, why could he do this? Why could she do this to me? I'm meditating on how bad they are. I would never do that. Have, we ever, have you ever said that? I would never do that, whatever that was. No, maybe you wouldn't. We would do something equally bad, just different. We watch hero movies, and we're meditating on, wouldn't it be cool to save the world? I'll take the adulation. You know what? I'll be happy just knowing I saved the world, even if no one applauds me. We're meditating, in a certain sense, on our goodness. Thinking changes the way we live. Thinking changes the way we live. I'm from Detroit. Henry Ford once said, one man thinks he can, and one man thinks he can't. And they're both right. What we fill our mind with totally affects the way we live. It affects the way we see reality. And Christian meditation is the way we see the world from God's point of view, where we meditate on his scriptures. It trains our mind. And, and the result is it brings us blessedness, fruitfulness, solidity, prosperity, evergreen. I like to call meditation thinking furiously in prayer. Saying, God, I want to understand this passage. I want to understand things. So where does this leave us? First, it leaves us with the broad promises of God. Blessedness, happiness, truth, joy, life, hope, fruit, prosperity, significance, purpose. And this is a promise from God. And, and God's promise is his commitment to our future. In World War II, when we made an alliance with Britain, we committed as a country all of our resources to the future of Britain. We said, see all that coal we have in the mountains? It's yours. See this, the, the, the raw materials for steel? It's yours. See our resources, our people who can make ships and tanks? And it's, it's yours. When we made an alliance with Britain, we said, what ours, what, what's ours is yours. And when God makes promises in Scripture, he says, see how I made heaven and earth? See how I, I parted the Red Sea? See how I raised up the mountains? See the might and the power of the ocean? See the thunderstorms? See the lightning bolts that I have in my storehouse? It's yours. It's God's commitment to our future. And it's given to those who delight in God's word and meditate on it day and night. Everybody else is just chaffy. So, go delight in God's word and meditate on it day and night. That's it. But I can't end the sermon there, can I? I really can't end the sermon there because if we're, if we're, if we're honest and like we're in church, let's be honest for this moment, I don't delight in God's word. I mean, I tell you, I have a lot of delight in God's word. I do. I meditate on it most days for a while, quite a while, actually. I mean, I really like to meditate on God's word. 
I, do, I can't say I even meditate on the morning and the night, but certainly not throughout the day. And, and, and I like God's word, and on occasion it's even my delight. But if the promise comes to me because I delight in God's word as my delight, and if the promise comes to me because I meditate on it day and night, I am toast. God's word is supposed to bring us life. And when I read this, I feel, when I'm honest, I just think, what hope do I have? I mean, I'm growing, and I, I am growing and delighting it. I will say that. And the few times where I really think I've arrived and I think, I delight in God's word, what's their problem? Holy smokes, right there, you know, Sam, you're, you're, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, lest in due time, he humble me for myself, right? Earlier on, I read a psalm, a verse from Psalm 49. It said, my mouth will speak wisdom, the meditation of my heart will be understanding, I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. How do we solve the riddle of Psalm 1? How can we have the blessedness that God promises when when we're honest, we don't have it? How do we solve this riddle? The key tension in the Old Testament, look, there's a lot of tensions in the Old Testament. There's one key tension in all of the Old Testament, and, and it's over and over and over again. It is... How can God remain holy and completely faithful to us? How can God, if he remains holy, he can't connect with us. And if he connects with us, aren't we going to contaminate him in some ways because we're not holy? Sometimes God says, as long as you're faithful, I will bless you. We like that. Well, we don't like that one because we're not always faithful, right? Other times he says, no matter what. I mean, you know, you have the story of Hosea and, and the unfaithful wife, and God says, go woo her. She hasn't done anything to say, I'm, I've repented. God says, go woo her. So sometimes God says, as long as you're faithful, I will be faithful. Sometimes he says, no matter what, I will be faithful. Which is it? Sometimes God seems conditional. His love seems conditional, and sometimes it seems unconditional. Which God is it? This tension in the Old Testament is everywhere, on every page, and it's never resolved until the cross of Christ. In the cross of Christ, the law of God and the love of God kissed. It's called the doctrine of substitution. On the cross, Jesus took the death and the pain and the suffering that we should have. Jesus took that chaffiness feel. Jesus took the significance. Jesus took that emptiness that some of us feel at time. Jesus took that shame that all of us feel at time. Jesus took that, that, that uninvited feel that some of us feel like, oh, they're always invited, why am I not invited? Jesus took that abandonment. Jesus took the chaffy, empty life that we should experience. But he also lived the life that we should have lived. So he literally delighted in God's word. 10% of every word in scripture of Jesus, if you read the red letter editions, 10% of everything Jesus says is a quote from scripture. On the cross, Jesus says, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting scripture. Jesus says, into your hand I, have, I commit my spirit. He's quoting scripture. If, if you cut Jesus with a knife, he bled scripture. Jesus literally delighted in the law. He delighted in it and he meditated it. And you know what he said? He said, give my blessing to Springs Church. He said, I deserve it, but give it to Springs Church. He said, give them my stability. Give them my fruitfulness. Give them my glory. He says, pour it out on them because I am absorbing into my being the wickedness for what they've done. Now, I don't like the word wicked, but you know what? When Jesus says he's taking it for me, it melts my heart in some ways. 
You know, this is the meaning of the passage we see in 2 Corinthians where it says, for all the promises find their yes in him. Now, we always think of our promises, you're saying, God, you know, I'm going to raise my kids up right, so therefore you promised that you're going to make them, you know, never turn from your way, right? Listen, I think I did an okay job with my kids, like maybe C minus. I mean, I tried. I taught him the right things, but unfortunately, he also saw the way I lived, you know? And if I base my hope for my kids on the way I lived, I am doomed. But if I base my hope on the goodness and the rightness, righteousness of Jesus, I have all the hope in the world that my kids will come to the Lord and they will live lives for the Lord. This is the meaning of another passage in 2 Corinthians. Paul is talking about the Jews of his day, but he's also talking about the Jews for the previous thousand or more years. He says, in their minds, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, she might get it up there, sorry about that. To this day, when they read the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is the veil taken away. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Do you want to read Psalm 1 and have hope? Let's take the veil away. Psalm 1 is not about you or me. Psalm 1 is about Jesus. Jesus delighted in the law day and night. Jesus meditated on the law day and night. And Jesus said, do you want to have hope for yourself? See me fulfilling the law. Do you want to have hope for your children? See me law fulfilling the law. Do you want to have hope for all the promises we find in God? See Jesus living the life we should have lived. If you're an artist of any kind, you all know something that you did that you just, you, you sort of say, that was good. I mean, I like it. You know, you're a little embarrassed at times to say it. But in my book, Hearing God, one of the things I say is, God doesn't speak to us because of our greatness. He speaks to us because of his greatness. I want to say, God doesn't bless us because of our greatness. He blesses us for his greatness. But what a foundation. His greatness. And you know what happens when I start to think of God's greatness? When I start to see Jesus taking my chaffiness my insignificance. When I see Jesus absorbing this into himself, you know what happens to me? I start to meditate on his word a little bit more. I actually start to delight. I actually become the person God wants me to simply by seeing Jesus fulfill this. Simply by seeing Jesus be the man I will never be until I see Jesus being the man I should be. And slowly but surely, God turns this chaffy, empty seed into a tree. I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to have the worship team come forward. And I'm going to have the altar team come up front, if you want, as we sing a closing song. And, you know, here's what my prayer is. I, I, as I was praying, you know, I was going to do a different sermon. And like Pastor Michael, I, I just felt I want to change sermons. And what I felt was some of us have been believers for years, you know, we've been walking the road, we've been walking the way, we see the world, we see the way of the world, and sometimes we go, it looks good, it looks easier, it looks more attractive at times. And, and, and we, we, we become a little cynical. We begin to lose our hope in the promises of God. We begin to say, I don't see that fruit that was promised. I don't quite feel that delight that I used to feel. What I want to pray for us is that we see the greatness of God. And based on that greatness, we have hope again. We say, you know, look at, if I got blessedness because I really did meditate day and night and I really did delight in God, I think that'd be great. I mean, I'd, I'd love to be blessed, Father. That's okay. But think, if I can say I am blessed because of God, Christ's greatness, it means I give my life in worship. I mean, even my blessedness is just an expression of God's goodness. So let me pray a minute. 
Father, the world tells us to have self-esteem, to think how good we are. The world tells us we don't need you. But your word says that you sustain our very being. You give us breath. But your word also says that you commit your entire resources to our well-being. You have a promise greater than the United States gave the Britain. You have a promise of the kingdom of God that created this world for our welfare. And Father, we, we repent for our cynicism. We repent for that. And we say we choose to believe in your promises again. And, and you know, brothers and sisters, if any of you feel like you want to just be, be prayed over to re engage in the promises of God. I ask you to come forward and people will pray over you. If you want to just come forward and pray and they come and pray over you, just say, you know, I just want to be alone with the Lord. That's okay. They understand. But let's come before the Lord and say, I want the promises of God. I want to be empowered by the truth and the beauty and the greatness of God and Him alone. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Praise God. Pastor Sam, you don't know this, but yesterday I was actually praying in my prayer time. Um, me and the Lord have been wrestling through a few things together. And uh, there's a few areas that I want to grow in my life. I want to see growth. I want to see fruit. Um, I want to be more giving. I was praying with him the other day. I said, I, I want to see myself grow into a place of giving. I want to give. And there's even areas 
to be completely honest, in ministry, I've been hurt by individuals and people. And I said, God, I, I see you, the way you forgive me, and the way you cheerlead me on, and the way you love me. I want to act like that. I want to become those people's greatest advocate. I want to say, God, do work in their life. Bless them. Pour upon them. And as I was praying these things, just in areas of my life, there was other areas as well, I began to come to the conclusion, God, I just can't do it. There's not a promise that I can give to you that I'm going to be able to change these areas of my life or my heart. And then I said this. This is exactly what came out of my mouth. I said, it doesn't matter how much you threaten me or how much you promise blessing upon me. I will never be able to do it. I'll never be able to do it. We literally in the Bible have chapter after chapter, year after year of history of God saying, I will bless you or I will threaten you. I will do anything to get you to do what will bless your life. And time and time again, nobody ever did it. And as I began to be honest with God, and I said, I can't. It doesn't matter how much you say you'll bless me or how much you'll say you threaten me. It doesn't make any difference. I cannot change. The only thing I could do at this moment is trust in the promises and the commitment that you have made to do it in my life for me. That is it. And as I surrendered it, as I said that, I felt the Holy Spirit say, now I can work. Now I could work. See, God can only move through a vessel of surrender and faith. He says, I can't move any other way. If you're still in the way and you're trying, the problem with Christianity, and I close with this, and I'll just pray for his journey. The problem with Christianity is we think it'll be 60% God, 40% me. 80% God, 20% me. It'll be 90% God, 10% me. And God is saying, no, you're missing this whole thing. You were crucified with me on the cross. It's none of you. It is all of me. See, we don't get to heaven, and this is amazing. We don't get to heaven and say, oh, Jesus, I get 10% of the crowd. You get 90% of it. He says, no, no, you cast all of it before my feet. You cast all of it. And it's that understanding, that honesty with God, a heart that could get honest and say, you know what? It doesn't matter how much you say you'll bless me or how much you say you'll threaten me. I will never do this in my own ability or strength. It will never change that God says, now I could begin to move. Now I could begin to move. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you, Lord God. What a word. What a word to just think upon. What a word, God. Father, we come before you today, and we don't bring any promises anymore. I am done making promises to God. I am finished because I'm just a liar. I'm a liar. We're liars. Oh, I'm going to do this. Oh, you. Oh, I'm going to do. God, we lie. Father, we come and we lay down all of that. We lay down our cynicism. We lay down what we think we could do. We put it down and we come with full assurance and faith on one thing and one thing alone, which is your sacrifice and which is your covenant that you have made with us. We come and say, God, we trust in your word. And although I said it yesterday in my prayer time, I don't see it yet. I don't see the full measure of what I believe you want to produce in my life and in this church. You are not getting rid of me. I'm going to keep coming back and lay my life upon your promises. I'm going to keep coming back and lay my life on your truth. I'm going to keep coming back because I have nowhere else to go. So God, we do that today as a church. Whether it's a healing we're asking for, God, in our emotions, our mind, our lives. Lord, whether it's salvation in our family members, God, whether it's just growing and being a tool and a utensil for your glory, God, whatever it is, a greater boldness, we say we cannot do it through promise, a blessing, or of threatening. We do it only by holding on to the finished work of Jesus Christ. We bless you today and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Now, before you head out, don't forget the Hearing God in Conversation, Sam's book in the, in the front lobby, actually the info table. You can pick them up there. They are incredible. I'd encourage you to get this book and to read through it. Also, if anybody needs prayer, we've been praying for healing specifically. This prayer and altar ministry team is going to be up here. You can feel free to come up and pray after service together. Otherwise, I want you to have a wonderful, wonderful day. Have an awesome Sunday afternoon, and we'll be back again this week, Wednesday, for prayer. Our community groups that are happening all week long. You can stop in our Connect Center and check that out, or come back next Sunday, and we'll see you again. Be blessed and have an awesome, awesome week.